I get a ton of questions about what to offer to which god, despite the now three videos that I've done on the topic of offerings. So I think it's about time to come back to offerings and really dive deep. The first video in this series will cover the how, when, where, and why of offering in the modern day, as well as in ancient times, and my next video will cover what was offered in ancient times, why we don't offer animals anymore generally, and what we can now offer instead. Let's circle back to offerings in Hellenism. Kaerete. One of the first things that people notice about pagan traditions that distinguished most reconstructionist or revivalist pagans and many surviving modern polytheist traditions are the ideas surrounding offering and reciprocity. We don't only offer hymns and study of the texts, but also often physical goods, such as incense, libations of various liquids like wine, milk, honey, water, tea, etc. Votive offerings were also common in ancient times, and the aforementioned hymns and study would be counted as devotional offerings or smokeless offerings, which were typically offered by poets as part of their profession. The religions most modern people have any familiarity with have no such concept, seeing every action they commit as being judged by their deities rather than as a normal part of their daily lives. Reciprocity and gift exchange are frequently mistaken for bribery, so let's take a deeper look into how offerings worked in ancient times and how a modern ritual to the Theoi might look. My recently updated video on prayer, link is in the iCard, provides foundational material on prayer construction and a brief overview of ritual, but this is where we're going to be going a bit deeper into how ritual works and how we build relationships with the gods through a lifetime. You might recognize some of what I say in this video from the older one, though trust me when I tell you there will be a lot of new information here as well. I added over seven pages of script to this video alone, and that's not counting the second video that will be coming out after it on what to offer, where I plan to cover devotional offerings, votives, animal and vegetal offerings, and why we don't offer animals in the modern day in far, far more depth. This video will be divided into three parts. The first takes a look at the why behind offering, the concepts of Caris, Hosios, and Eusebea. The second covers the where and when of offering, with numerous historical examples. And finally, part three will cover the structure of a Hellenist ritual in a little more depth from start to finish, briefly touching on prayer, cleansing practices, the difference between an altar and a shrine, and disposal of offerings. Let's get to it. Part 1. The Why of Offering the idea of gift exchange, which I gave its own whole video and have talked about in numerous other videos all over the channel, is essential to the ancient Hellenic culture and religion. Zeus himself was said to have gained some of his powers and weapons from gift exchange with the Kuklops and the Hundred-Handed Ones. Even Xenia relies on gift exchange, reciprocity, and respect at its base. In fact, according to Simon Poulain in his book Prayer and Greek Religion, the cycles of Charis, which is the name in Greek for the reciprocity cycle with the gods, and Xenia were interlinked concepts. He compares the prayers entreating the gods to act on behalf of Penelope on the strength of Odysseus' past prayers and offerings to the request to Nestor for help from Telemachus on the strength of Odysseus' past deeds. Hear me, O child of the Aegis, at Tritona, if ever wildly Odysseus in his halls burnt for you fat thighs of oxen or sheep, remember these now, I ask you, cries Penelope, and I entreat you, if ever my father, noble Odysseus, performed for you some word or deed that he had promised, remember these now, I ask of you, begs Telemachus. So what exactly is Caris? Calling it reciprocity and gift exchange hints at its meaning and purpose in Hellenism, but barely scratches the surface. Etymologically, it means favor, goodwill, but also gratitude, thanks, influence, delight, gratification, grace, and elegance. According to Little and Scott's A Greek-English Lexicon, it can mean a grace or favor felt on the part of the doer, but more frequently on the part of the receiver, in the form of thankfulness and gratitude. It means a favor or gift returned, the delight of that return, a thing done for another's sake and the pleasure it is done for. These favors are freely done out of kindness, and this is how it is used when we refer to the gods in the gift exchange between us and them. The gods need nothing from us, but through their greatness and our love of them, we offer and build relationships through a lifetime. 
Karis is the purpose of offering, but also its action. It is a word that embodies many levels of concepts in ancient religion and wraps itself in prayer, ritual, spectacle, festival. It is, for lack of a more concise definition, the culmination of the relationship each individual has built with each god and also the gods on the whole, as well as the community standing in the eyes of the gods and the god in question. It encapsulates the feelings associated with interacting within the confines of these relationships with deities, as well as the whole of the relationship itself. It's complex, multifaceted, and beautiful, and its meaning unfolds in layers as you build and maintain your relationships with deities. I've repeated this definition over and over in my work, and there's a reason for it. Kadis is at the center of every aspect of Hellenist religion. It is the object of every festival, every prayer, every moment spent at the altar, every glance at a shrine. It is the context for every divine experience and revelation, the beating heart of Hellenic polytheism and the revivalist approach modern people take, as well as the ancients we learned the concept from. Offering in a relationship of Karis doesn't constitute a one-to-one -one bribe where the gods are expected to immediately grant a request simply because an offering of such and such a magnitude is given. The gods aren't vending machines. Reciprocity in Hellenism is voluntary, though expected of humans by the gods if we want to form relationships of any kind with them. The gods are a lot more powerful and knowledgeable than we as humans could ever be, and have lived longer than we can imagine. If they delight in what we offer to them and choose to reciprocate, humans can receive incredible blessings in return. Every aspect of my life personally has changed from my relationship with the Theoi, and so has nearly every aspect of my worldview. Kadis is also something that must be actively maintained by humans in order to function, and it is the maintenance of Kadis that informs the other concepts I mentioned in the intro for this section, Eusebea and Hosios. Both of these words are frequently translated as piety, though the former is much more a positive sense than the latter. If you're talking about another person and chastising them for not keeping a proper relationship with the gods, you'll probably refer to them as onholsion or impious. If you're talking about another person and how good a job they're doing in their relationship with the gods or describing a pious action in a positive way, you'll probably use the term eusebis. These words mean a lot more than simply being religious or reverent, though these are a part of their meaning in ancient Hellenism. Rather, they point to the maintenance of a right relationship with the gods in accordance with what is themis, or proper in their eyes. Themis is also a goddess, the mother of the Horai, the Morai, Dike, Erene, and Eunomia, or the goddesses of the seasons of fate, justice, peace, and good order. Themis was a term often used to refer to things from the perspective of the gods, those bits of human life which they were said to weigh in on, such as the practices surrounding Xenia, burial of the dead, proper attitudes towards parents and family, the appropriate way to sacrifice, who is allowed to touch sacred objects, how certain acts are to be performed, and many other things. Basically, if something could cause Agos, see my video on the topic in the iCard for what that is, it was against the concept of Themis. For example, in the Odyssey Book 10, lines 65 through 76, Aeolus tells Odysseus that it is not Themis to assist someone hated by the gods when he comes back to him and reports that his crew had opened the bag of winds previously gifted in their last encounter. I, with a sorrowful heart, spoke among them and said, Bane did my evil comrades work me, and therewith sleep accursed, but bring ye healing, my friends, for with you is the power. So I spoke and addressed them with gentle words, but they were silent. Then their father answered and said, Begone from our island with speed, thou vilest of all that live. In no wise may I help or send upon his way a man who is hated of the blessed gods. Begone, for thou comest hither as one hated of the immortals. So saying, he sent me forth from the house groaning heavily. A more more literal translation is that it is appropriate to send away those who are hated by the gods, for the gods themselves are the source of their troubles. Certain parts of human life are said to be under the purview of the gods, when we enter reciprocal relationships with them, and therefore to be Hosios or Eusebea, we must make sure that we live in accordance with those ideas. And one of the major ones is giving the gods their due time, or honors, as often as we can within the means we have available as worshippers. Hesiod in Works and Days tells us about the silver race of humans humans who were extinguished when they refused to do what was Themis for normal men, honoring the gods. Then they who dwell on Olympus made a second generation, which was of the silver and less noble by far. It was like the golden race neither in body nor in spirit. A child was brought up at a home in his good mother's side a hundred years, an utter simpleton playing childlessly in his own home. But when they were full grown and coming to the full measure of their prime, they lived only a little time and then in sorrow because of their foolishness. For they could not keep from sinning and from wronging one another, nor would they serve the immortals nor sacrifice on the holy altars of the blessed 
blessed ones, as is Themis for men to do wherever they dwell. Then Zeus, the son of Kronos, was angry and put them away, because they would not give honor to the blessed gods who live on Olympus. Clearly, giving offerings and prayers to the gods in Hesiod's time was considered an essential part of the relationship with them, and even as an essential part of maintaining the human condition under the watchful eyes of the gods. This makes a lot of sense if you think about it in terms of human relationships. If you're seeking friendship with someone, you need to respect their boundaries and actively make time to spend with the other person. I know that isn't quite analogous to all the things the gods were said to take issue with, but when talking about offerings and piety, it seems to fit here. When we come before the gods and make offerings and offer prayer, we're actively choosing to spend time with them and deepen our relationships in the process. Prayers in ancient Greece frequently referred to the previous offerings given both by the worshiper and others in their house over the course of lifetimes, suggesting that the gods were expected to remember acts of piety on their part when something big was requested of them. The more often you offer what you can with an honest and open heart, the more you pray and dedicate your time to the gods, the more you'll be able to build cards with them over a lifetime. With that in mind, let's take a look at the when and where of offering. Part two, when and where to offer. Anyone who has ever visited Greece or even looked at pictures has seen the majestic temple ruins that dot the landscape, particularly the incredible Parthenon Temple of Athena on the Athenian Acropolis and the Temple of Apollon at Delphi. These breathtaking feats of architecture were built with such care that many of the columns and altars still exist in the modern day, despite millennia of defacing, repurposing, and general disrespect and lack of maintenance following the banning of polytheistic religious observance in the Roman Empire. These aren't the only sites the ancients would offer at, however. There were also temenoi, or sanctuary sites that were devoted to the gods, as well as local altars and shrines for neighborhoods that were tended by local priesthoods and residents. There were also private and semi-public altars and shrines on private land that were established and maintained by individuals and families due to epiphanies, and cave cults to the nymphs, Pan, and others established by devotion from locals to these divinities. Each of these subcategories of sacred sites could easily be their own video, and I may make a few of them in the future, but for most modern pagans, we don't have access to them, and I feel in a more practical video, getting too far into them here wouldn't be too useful. That said, these sacred sites in ancient times would have been bustling with activity on sacred days. Wait, sacred days, you say? What do you mean by sacred days? I covered this more thoroughly in my video on the Athenian festival calendar, link in the iCard if you haven't seen that. The gist is that the ancients had a lunar calendar rather than a solar one, and celebrated the birthdays of the gods with offerings every lunar month rather than once a year. Often, gods also had festivals on the day that corresponds with their birth, or on the month that also corresponds with their monthly sacred day, i.e. 6-6 for Artemis, or 7-7 in their calendars for Apollon. These calendars changed every year because of their lunar nature, so June 6th wouldn't be Artemis' festival dates every year, nor July 7th Apollon's. Again, check out the video if you want to know more about how all of this worked. While the image that most readily comes to mind when the word sacrifice is mentioned is an animal walked up by its keeper to a temple altar before its blood was spilled in the name of a deity, the majority of sacrifices the average ancient person gave would occur in the home rather than at temple or sanctuary altars, and would consist of incense and libations. The word sacrifice here does doesn't specifically mean an animal sacrifice, as is often implied today, anyhow, in scholarship or pagan circles. It can mean a wide variety of vegetal sacrifices, such as incense, grains, honey and barley cakes, libations of wine and olive oil, first fruits of the garden, etc. These offerings are sacrifices because once they're used up, you can't get them back. Well, unless you want to eat ashes out of your fire pit or lick wine off the ground, that is. This is because offerings were typically put into a hearth fire that would be tended by the majority of homes and would have to be replaced at the conclusion of a major polluting event, such as a birth or a death, with fire from a neighboring unpolluted home. This includes libations, which typically would be only a few drops of liquid and thereby would pose no risk to putting a fire out. It was said that the pleasing smoke, or knise, would rise from the burning fat from animal offerings or from the libations of specifically sweet red wine poured onto the fire that pleased the gods. I'll get into to why animal offerings aren't particularly viable in the modern day in the next video on what offerings the ancients gave and what offerings we might give in the modern day. And we'll place a link in the iCard here when that video comes out in a couple of weeks. Because the majority of modern pagans live in apartments or houses without a lot of property for an above ground burn pit, and because the risk of indoor fires that burning offerings in a modern fireplace might pose, the burning method may not be a practical way to offer to the gods for the majority of modern pagans that aren't out in the wilds on camping trips with burn permits. If you have the space in your house for a safe burn pit, 
go for it. I have one out front that I burn the first fruits of my garden in to Demeter each year and have used to perform the last rites for my father when he passed away. But the majority of y'all probably need a different option. Option one would be to step outside and pour your libations on the ground. This is probably risky for a lot of folks as I covered in my prayer video that most prayers should be done out loud when possible and a lot of areas aren't very friendly to pagans. This is also an option for disposing of libations done via the second method, which is a vessel of some kind indoor on the altar where you pray. Altars are different from shrines, by the way, though typically they're combined by most modern pagans pressed for space. A shrine is where the representation of the gods or icons are placed, and an altar is where offerings are presented to the gods. You can have an outdoor altar like my burn pit or like the pillar altars often found at property boundaries where libations were poured in ancient times. For food offerings, like first fruits of the garden, honey cakes, etc., for Aaronic or local divinities, they can be left on the altar for a period of time that feels safe and appropriate to your climate and then disposed of with reverence later on. I don't want to give a prescriptive time period here because climates vary and so do the conditions in houses. A piece of fruit will rot a heck of a lot faster at 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 70% humidity than it will at 65 and 10% respectively. Also, ants, cockroaches, rats, and other pests are bigger problems in some areas than others. We deal with odorous house ants every spring and summer but I've never seen a cockroach outside of a zoo. Some food offerings that appeal to the ants are disposed of much more quickly in my house than those they'd typically ignore. It's best not to eat the offerings given, as in ancient times, this was considered a taboo given that the majority of ancient offerings were burned, and even those that weren't, that were set aside for the gods, such as those in Atheoxania, were considered to belong to them, and it was wrong to eat them. Plutarch, in his Questions Convivales, said that he should not, as if he were to forage in an enemy's country, carry all he can with him or, like those who go to possess a newfound land, by the excessive number of his own friends, incommode or exclude the friends of the inviter, so that the inviter must be in the same case as those that set forth suppers to Hecate and the gods who avert evil, of which neither they nor their family partake except the smoke and trouble. This is referencing the fact that because many passers-by would eat the offerings to Hecate at the crossroads, those who offered wouldn't receive the benefits as she couldn't partake before the wanderers did. So eating offerings to the gods was taboo, and remember, the bones and fat of animals animals were the offering, not the meat, and grain and fruit, vegetables, etc. offering were typically burned or were otherwise not eaten, except perhaps by the priests dedicated to the gods. Incense was the most common offering we know of in addition to libations in ancient times. Quite often, Greek homes would keep bags of incense available to sprinkle in the hearth or on burning braziers for the gods for regular offerings. I recommend getting charcoal instant light pucks and resin over stick incense if you have the room and it's allowed, as stick incense is often made with wasteful essential oils, which I also heavily recommend against giving as offerings. I covered the safety issues with essential oils in my own video, link in the iCard if you missed it. Disposing of incense ashes is pretty easy. You can either bury them outside, scatter them in your garden, or separate them carefully from the trash by putting them in a bag or wrapping them and throwing them away. It's very similar to how you would dispose of food offerings, as I mentioned earlier. I'll cover incense and the various kinds of resins you can get and where to get them more in the video on what to offer. In fact, according to Hesiod, sacrifices should be made twice daily, usually in the morning and at night. Wealth should not be seized. God-given wealth is much better, for if a man takes great wealth violently and perforce, or if he steals it through his tongue, as often happens when gain deceives men's sense and dishonor tramples down his honor, the gods soon blot him out and make that man's house low, and wealth attends him only for a little time. Alike with him who does wrong to a suppliant or guest, or who goes up to his brother's bed and commits unnatural sin lying with his wife, or who infatuatedly offends against fatherless children, or who abuses his old father at the cheerless threshold of old age and attacks him with harsh words. Truly Zeus himself is angry, and at the last lays on him a heavy requital for his evil doing. But do you turn your foolish heart altogether away from these things, and, as far as you are able, sacrifice to the deathless gods purely and cleanly, and burn rich meats also, and at other times propitiate them with libations and incense, both when you go to bed and when the holy light has come back, that they may be gracious to you in heart and spirit, so that you may buy another's holding and not another yours. I know that most folks in the pagan community are going to have a much harder time making time for sacrifices twice every day, especially neurodivergent folks who have to make a decision every time they act rather than forming habits the way that neurotypical people do. I typically offer once a day, either shortly after rising or just before starting my work for the day, after I check my calendar to see if the day is sacred to any of the gods to make sure that deity gets their honors in addition to those that I offer daily as a matter of course. I don't always remember to give offerings in the evening and tend to 
to shoot for daily consistency as much as possible, though for some folks that might be difficult to begin with. Although it's always an ideal to shoot for, if you struggle with maintaining daily consistency, it's always better to try and give what you can rather than drowning guilt and shame over the times you couldn't. I'm sure that many ancient people missed offerings from time to time, and modern life makes making time for religious practice difficult and makes the time spent with the gods and prayer and offering all the more precious. Something is always better than nothing. I want to go ahead and italicize this for folks who are in unsafe conditions such as being closeted or living with an abusive spouse, parent, relative, or roommate. Offer when it's safe. Offer when you can. Offer with your whole heart, and if you feel you must, make up for your fallow periods when you're in a safer position and can express your religion more freely at home. I have a whole video on hacks for the broom closet. Link is in the iCard above if you'd like some advice on worship in these sorts of situations. It seems that there were specific times a day where offerings were given to various gods by ancient people as well. Offering to the Oranic and local divinities were typically made at dawn or upon arriving for folks who aren't farmers or early risers. Offerings to the dead were typically made at the hottest hour of the day, and offerings to Chthonic deities were typically made outside at night before bed. That said, in the epics, offerings were made at mealtimes as well, especially libations, and during life transition ceremonies such as weddings or funerals. Offerings would also be made by entire groups of people during festivals and feasts, as well as dancing and song that would follow, which were often seen as offerings to the gods as well, as they are said to delight in humans delighting in them when we celebrate together. Offerings were also frequently given just before crossing rivers during travel, as I mentioned for my video on prayer, and generally while on the road just before leaving for a trip, as well as at military camps during active wartime. You don't need icons to offer. In fact, due to the previous examples given, you could technically offer anywhere so long as you bring something to purify yourself with beforehand. Just make sure you do so safely and aren't leaving behind waste for some park ranger to clean up if you're doing so in a public or national park. Part three, how to give an offering. One of my favorite books on the topics of offerings and sacrifices, Smoke Signals for the Gods by F.S. Nyden, describes in detail the processes and attitudes that accompanied various kinds of sacrifice. Most sacrifices of any kind began with purification to rid oneself of miasma, or the polluting force which separates us from the gods. Miasma is another topic that I covered in an older video, which was in the iCard link for the Agos video earlier. But for this purpose of simplicity, I'll define it as a contagious pollution that emanates from death, displeasure from the gods, and bodily functions such as intercourse and defecation. There are other aspects to it as well, but unless you've killed someone outside of battle, most of them likely don't apply to you. Typically, this purification was done with a sprinkling of seawater or water that had a torture-lit sprig of an herb extinguished in it by a priest, and with the sprinkling of barley in an area if it wasn't a temple or home altar. Sometimes, grains were given as preliminary sacrifices along with the incense to attract the gods' attention with the smoke. Next, a prayer would be said, often with a libation and incense, as the fire was lit to draw the attention of the god or gods being offered to. The Greek gods were often said to observe these rites with interest, indicating their approval or disapproval by their presence. We'll get into the feelings associated with this later. Hestia always received the first prayer and the last offering, as she connects us to the gods through the sacred hearth fire, even if you're not burning your offerings in the modern day. Unless you're offering a devotional, in which case you'd call Hermes or the Muses first, depending on the kind of devotional you're doing. See the first part of the Muse God profile for why this would be. Libations are a mere few drops of liquid poured from a cup into the fire or onto the ground. For Aonic deities, multiple libations can be poured from the same cup. For Chthonic deities and the dead, however, a koes would have to be performed. In a koes, only the exact amount given to the deity or deceased person would be put into the cup and the whole thing would be upended onto the altar or onto the ground. These rituals were performed at grave sites or outside, off the property of the person in question, and the purification would happen afterwards to cleanse the worshipper of the miasma of contact with Chthonic entities in ancient times. In communal offerings involving animals, the animals would be slaughtered and their entrails examined to see if they were perfect. The tails would be cut off and thrown onto the fire to see how they burned and curled, for if the tail didn't make the right shape as it burned, it was said to be an ill omen for the acceptance of the sacrifice. If this was a collective offering that included a theoxania, or a feast, the bones and fat would most often be burned while meat for the feasters was roasted over the same fire, lathered with wine to increase the smoke, or knise, that would keep the dod's attention, along with prayers and song calling for it. 
The Theoxania would also include an entire table of food that was specifically reserved for the gods, often including some portions of meat, as well as things like cakes, first fruits offerings, vegetables, fruit, etc. Sometimes, if the god was an underwater deity, such as Poseidon, Okeanos, or a river god, the sacrifice would be bound and drowned, sent to the god under the waves or into the river. Sometimes a god would receive an offering whole, where no feasting occurred, and sometimes this was the case for singular sacrifices at shrines. Sometimes the priest would take an animal and sacrifice on behalf of the recipient, as would happen with foreigners at public shrines, and sometimes the ancients would perform the sacrifice themselves. All home sacrifices were performed by members of the household in ancient times. Regardless, purity and the proper attitude of thankfulness and respect was tantamount, especially at group rituals. A single impious person, or someone who lacks the quality of hosios, could potentially poison collective caris, as was brought up by Eskines while referencing those who give the, these people quarter. If they don't punish the the sacrilegious, they won't sacrifice in a respectable way to Apollon or Artemis or Leto or Athena Pronaia. Those gods won't receive victims from them either. If there's a jerk in your group, your offering may well fail. Plato later reversed the idea, proposing that only the impious themselves would be rejected, but still suggesting punishing them for those crimes on behalf of collective caudus. Clearly, punishing people on a state level for impiety isn't going to be a thing in the modern day, nor should it, especially given the plurality of religious traditions, but it's a good reason to keep people who don't respect your practice out of your rituals. If you think about it, attitude being proper makes sense even from a human perspective. Have you ever had a friend give you something on the mere expectations you'll do something back, especially if they make it obvious that that's their only motivation? Notice how uncomfortable that feels. Now, think about the relationship between a god and a person. There must be mutual love and respect there as well. Next, during the burning, prayers were said, sometimes formally with the structure of praise argument requests, sometimes slightly more informally. As I covered in the second part of my Muse God profile, music was typically performed at communal offerings by bards on the lyre, though we're not sure if this was always the case for private offerings. In fact, the epics are pretty unclear on the idea and music accompanied all forms of tragedy and comedy, so those aren't a very good gauge for performance as a requirement either. Offerings were given for several reasons. Thanksgiving for blessings received, such as financial stability, victory in battle, or a good harvest, often accompanied by a request for future blessings was a main reason. Requests for specific things was another, yet another was simple praise or honor to the god, which was considered by some ancient authors to be the most virtuous reason. One last reason was penance, either for angering the god or for perceived wrongs against the community. Offerings of this sort were given whole, meaning no portion was reserved for the person doing the offering. I mentioned how one would determine if an animal offering were accepted, but what of vegetal offerings like incense and libations? For incense and other burned offerings, such as cakes, grains, first fruits of the gardens, etc., the smoke holds the key. It was said that if the smoke blows toward you or horizontally, the gods were rejecting the offering. There were apparently diviners who claimed that they could interpret detailed messages in smoke offerings, but little survives of their art into the modern day. So a modern practitioner may need to rely on another indication of divine acceptance, that of Thusia, or the joy of accepted offering. If you're really concerned, you could perform a lot divination or another form of divination to see if the gods looked favorably upon your offering. Naiden discusses how ancient writers would describe the joy an accepted offering would bring. Sacrificial dancing, meaning dancing on behalf of the god, could accompany such a feeling. Most communal offerings had traditional choreographed dances accompanying them, though again, private home rites likely didn't. This positive feeling would be absent if the sacrifice was rejected. Described by some authors by this person standing beside the priest feeling less like a priest and more like a butcher. It isn't the person making the offering that determines this Naiden stresses, but the god themselves. Themselves. Why might a god reject an offering? I already mentioned impiety is one reason when discussing Theoxania. Obviously, if it's an issue in a group, then it would be an issue in an individual. Decorum is essential in offerings. That doesn't mean you have to be somber to be pious, as is implied in Christian church ceremonies. On the contrary, excitement at an offering is in itself a form of piety as is ritual dancing, singing, prayer, etc. It is the difference between crying out in joy and raging at an injury. If someone is yelling about their hand being in pain as the sacrifice is commencing, that's not the best thing, versus people crying out in excitement. Context and attitude are extremely important. Lack of ritual purity, especially if the supplicant or someone in the household has murdered someone and not received justice, was another reason. The gods also expected someone to wear fresh, clean attire when presenting offerings to them, and expected a certain level of personal care and grooming. Again, 
Again, this makes sense. If you show up at a friend's house in stained, filthy clothing stinking to high heaven, you're probably gonna get the side eye. Often, ritual robes were expected to be white, but not always. Sometimes, if a person had offended a different god, the god being offered to would reject the offering on those grounds. Zeus did this when Odysseus tried to offer to him after taking off Poseidon by blinding his son Polyphemus. It's good to maintain a healthy relationship with many gods for this reason as a Hellenist. The offering itself must be galos, or acceptable, meaning no malformed animals, dirty incense, cake drops on the ground, or scale, undrinkable wine. If you wouldn't give it to a human, don't give it to the gods. Breaking Xenia with a human can also cause the gods to reject offerings until the relationship has been repaired. It was said to invoke Agos, or divine wrath. A person's lack of personal virtue in their lives could cause a rejection of an offering in the cases of impiety, murder, Xenia breaking, or anything else that can cause Agos. Coming back to the concept of Kadis, the sum total of someone's offerings, experiences, relationship, and attitude toward the gods comprises their Kadis, but so does the attitude they approach an individual offering with. Sometimes the situations that cause rejections of offerings are not remediable, as in the example above with broken Xenia, and sometimes they're not, as in the case with a murderer who hasn't faced judgment in exile. Kadis is remembered and maintained between individuals, houses, communities, and the gods, and in times of desperation, one can call upon it when entreating the gods without an offering. Do this too often, however, and one slips into impiety and loses Hosios. One thing that didn't appear to cause rejection was the objective size of an offering. A small barley cake or tiny bits of incense scraped off the floor by someone in poverty, as stated by Elkifron, could be seen as a greater offering than scores of animals by an impious rich person. What's most important was that the offering was given freely out of thanks, love, and reciprocity, and that it represents a true gift in terms of the weight of what was given. And sometimes, the gods rejected offerings because the request was not within the person's fate or the fate of their community, or because there was a reason known only to them them as to why the request couldn't come to pass. This means that if you don't receive what you want, remember it isn't always your fault. Take a rigorous look at the circumstances surrounding the situation, sure, but if you can't find an explanation, there's a good chance that just as a friend can tell you no for reasons that are valid to them but not readily up for explanation, so too reciprocity with the gods is both a choice for you and them. Even if they like your offering and it adds to your kadas, you still may not get what you ask for due to personal reasons on the part of the gods. Okay, so how can we put all of this together as modern people? First, a modern Hellenist would create kernips by either extinguishing a match in tap water or stirring salt into it with a prayer to Hestia or Poseidon, respectively, then wash their hands and maybe their face as well if it's been a while in the water to purify before beginning. A flame should be lit, if possible, to Hestia. I use an olive oil lamp, some folks use candles, and for areas where fire isn't safe or allowed, a full candle or lamp can do. Next, a prayer to call all the gods, then a prayer and offering to Hestia as she always received offerings first and last. Next, offer to each of the gods that you plan to in the ritual, keeping in mind the sacred days in the calendar if it happens to be one. Finally, a prayer to thank the gods for attending and a final offering to Hestia. Disposal, as covered in the where and when section, should always happen when appropriate for your climate and when it feels most comfortable to you. As mentioned at the beginning, I covered prayer structure in a different video. Your prayers can either be off the cuff, in tripartite prayer format, or pre-written. Though it does take time to get used to, it will get easier as you practice more. Remember, our predecessors primarily learned by doing and being immersed in a culture where offering was not only regular, but expected. It might feel awkward at first, and that's okay. Just remember that we're not bribing the gods, but instead building reciprocal relationships with them through the exchange of gratitude as well as gifts. Know that apart from the very basic structure I outlined here, purification followed by a call to the gods to come, prayers to Hestia and offerings to her if you're in the home, and the presentation of the offering with praise and thanks as well as your request, the decorum expected of you is going to be as much a matter of trial and error as it is anything else that could be taught in a video or a book. The key here is to offer regularly, especially on the days of the lunar month sacred to each god, and remember the gods when good things happen to you. The more you can integrate them and their blessings into your practice and daily life, the deeper your cycle of goddess will get. I found that as my relationships with the gods have grown, spontaneous blessings have become a regular part of my life. I'm always excited and grateful to offer to the gods, as I know the good things that they have given me. It's the beauty of that relationship, another meaning of goddess, that drives it forward. And it's a beauty that can only be experienced in the doing. Thank you so much for sticking through that. 
I highly recommend checking out some of the books I've cited in the description if you can. They give a lot more depth and layering to the descriptions I've given than I could in a short video. If you're new here and enjoyed what you heard, please gut the subscribe button to examine its entrails and make beautiful music with the bell. Drop down into the comments and let me know what you learned, or just yell at me that I didn't include the neoplaconic view of sacrifice in my discussion for a second time. And special thanks to my patrons. You all are making my work possible week in and week out. I had to take a major pay cut when I moved to the long form, and it honestly has been extremely stressful, but I'm really excited and proud to call you all my patrons, and I'm so grateful for your contributions every month. The books I cite in the description and the subscriptions I need to maintain my channel get expensive, and your support goes such a long way towards helping me afford to keep everything running. And remember, we're stronger together.